So hello everybody and welcome to this EUA webinar about open innovation. So open innovation is the thing that we've been talking about for quite some time. It's something that many businesses and many universities indeed are, are heavily engaged in. It was indeed a uh, part of, of uh, EU policies in last commission. We had these three O's, open science, open to the world and open innovation. And then um, if you look at what EUA has been doing on innovation, you'd see that this features pretty prominently. We uploaded some uh, some things you can read. There's a big report on on uh, innovation ecosystems that you can get if you go to the handouts on your on your right side. Um, and if you have participated in some of our events on innovation, you you'd know that this is something that that comes up. And one of the attractions of of open innovation is the idea that large companies, and we'll have, a, we'll have an example of that, don't do all the research by themselves and then select what they, what they want to take, but that you are part of a larger ecosystem, you share knowledge, you uh, take the bits you want and uh, maybe share with others things you're not going to use right now, it might come back to you. That of course gives big opportunities for universities to engage. Um, it's about uh, having spin-outs, startups, student entrepreneurship, all these things flourish in this, in this context of, of open innovation. So we believe that, that that's one of the reasons why uh, this is so interesting and uh, I think this webinar has, has been part of proving that as we have a very, very high number of, of registrants. So, so we hope this is, this is interesting for you. Um, in the spirit of open innovation, we have a small innovation ecosystems here with all the different uh, stakeholders we have uh, from the European Commission, we have from business, and of course we have from from the university world as, as well. So I will not I will not go go uh, in deeply into uh, anything else and, and just take the the technical the technical issues that we have here. Um, so. You can use throughout the, the, the presentations, you can use the Q&A section on your right side and you can ask any question and we'll take that at the end. We'll have a sort of a moderated debate uh, at the end. Um, you also have the handouts that I mentioned uh, where you can find reports, you'll find a policy position. We hope that's, that's useful for, for you. And you, of course, have a, a public chat if you want to say hello to, to each other. I should also say that this uh, webinar is recorded and we will put it on YouTube afterwards. And I'm sure you all will have very clever questions, so that's not a problem, but um, now, now you know. Um, we'll hear some, I'm sure, very interesting presentations about the different aspects of open innovation and, and how that works. But I think we should begin a little bit with ourselves and have a small poll uh, it's interesting for us to know as well in terms of the who are actually in, engaged in this. So uh, we have a small poll which will be launched in a moment uh, where you can answer uh, if open innovation is part of your institution's innovation strategy. I know some of you don't come from universities, you can answer or not, but but uh, this is really to know whether universities are, are engaged in uh, in this. So I'll just um, <clears throat> I will submit one. and we see this grow. And it's interesting to see. We have about 60, it's stabilizing around 60% that say yes, this is part of their strategy. Uh, which is of course a small bias, but you could also imagine that many would log in because they say, uh, we don't have it yet, but we'd really like to learn about it. Um, so we have a an audience that uh, has an idea about what you think what open innovation is and um, has it as a part of their strategy. So that's a good starting point to have. I think from that we can go to the, the political side. Um, 
We have here with us Isidro Lazo Balestos. He's uh, from the cabinet of uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel. Um, and going to and has an interesting story before that in, in various both EU Commission and other other areas. Somebody who knows about, about open innovation has been working about this. Um, and who just start out with, with lining up the um, the policy framework that we're working at, at the European level. So please, easy draw. Go ahead. If he's not frozen. And we might have to wait a minute. This is what happens in webinars. Oh, and we lost him. Okay, James, if he doesn't come back in a minute, I think we'll just go to you. Let's just wait a small second. And now I'll close the board here. Okay, while Easy was logging back on, we might as well go to where much of the action is. Uh, James Lovegrove from Red Hat, big open source company. Um, and tell us about how, how they do it. And then we go back to the, the, the framework afterwards. James. James, I, th I think you're still muted. So, how's that? Yeah, oh, we hear you. Hello. Great. How's that for a rookie mistake? Um, I think we're on the first, yes, first page. Great. Well, thank you, Thomas. I'm, I'm happy to um, just uh, slip into your position um, while Sizzy Drope's uh, connectivity improves. Um, and I thought I'd just kick off with a couple of reflections. And uh, first is that there's quite a lot of common between open source and universities, um, to a certain extent inspired by centuries long role of universities to disseminate knowledge and unlock potential, whether it's students, faculty, uh, engaging, collaborating with a broader community of actors. Um, so I think really is to tackle challenges which, which no, no single organization company can do on its own. And I think secondly, um, open source software has its foundations rooted in universities, whether it's uh, Stallman, Richard Stallman um, at MIT in the early 80s, uh, where he pioneered principles of uh, copyright law to preserve the right to use, modify and distribute free software or even Linus Torvalds uh, developing the Linux operating system kernel at uh, the University of Helsinki back in the um, early 90s. So I guess these two events, and, and I think a few others, coupled with the fact that the internet boom uh, kicked off in the sort of mid 90s, really kind of gave, gave birth, if you like, to, to Red Hat. Um, and um, and the, the principal purpose of, of Red Hat was to do just those two things, to sort of tackle these problems which no film can do together, but also you do that in the open source way and really uh, to research and develop an open source alternative to uh, proprietary Goliaths. So my name is James Lovegrove. I'm the European Director of Public Policy based in Brussels. And I think over the next 10 or so minutes, maybe a little less, you tell me, Thomas, I'm going to go through what and how open innovation runs through courses through the uh, to Red Hat's DNA. Um, and then secondly, share some insights as to how our open innovation collaboration model uh, works with uh, universities. I appreciate time is somewhat tight. Uh, so I've, I've included right at the end a resources slide, which um, which has some just some of, of, of the links that I'd like to uh, share with uh, with folks today. 
So here's some numbers. Uh, funnily enough, they're, they're frequently used by policymakers and academics as success factors uh, or evidence that open source software has finally won out against uh, the, uh, the proverbial Goliath. Um, and indeed, 26 years after being founded, Red Hat has become uh, the largest open source software solution provider in the world. Uh, and then last year or so, we became a distinct uh, unit within IBM's hybrid cloud division, um, at the largest ever, interestingly, software acquisition for $34 billion. <clears throat> so practical success stories, factors also are, are interesting. And, and again, another proof point about how far um, open source has come. And here we are right at 100% of Fortune 500 companies, so it's airlines, telcos, banks, but also universities and, and governments. So I'm just tackling through the slides. So here's a couple of stats. So this is from GitHub. Uh, maybe it's a bit dated, a um, couple of years old, maybe you're so old. Um, however, I think it's interesting, it underscores this ma amazing, almost exponential growth of open source contributions on their repository. I think at the moment they're saying they've got 50 million plus uh, developers and, and the sizable footprint as actually found out when we were working on the copyright directive is, is here in, in, in Europe. And to a certain extent, open source success is somewhat self-perpetuating, right? Those, these innovative customers who've adopted this open source are now increasingly also embracing this innovation engine to co-innovate, uh, contribute uh, code upstream. Uh, and therefore that bolsters the, the digital capacity at this critical time. Uh, and I think it's quite, quite telling that, I think it was last week, um, you, the EU is in the process of defining what digital sovereignty means. And it's interesting to see that in the council conclusions they talk about to make autonomous technological choices and to develop and deploy strategic digital capacities. So very much in alignment there, um, at least we hope. Um, and then finally, the universities um, you know, also share this, this similar autonomy um, uh, or wish for autonomy and freedom as envisaged by, by Stallman all those, all those years ago. So this is really for that 40% of the first poll that you rolled out um, and to find out a little bit more what's under the Red Hat hood um, and really see how open source contributes open innovation, why Red Hat's compass continues to be this unlocking people's potential. Again, very much like universities sharing that knowledge and, and then building upon each other's, each other's discoveries. So this is a somewhat deceptive um, slide in that it looks very linear and very predictable, but in the sort of the cauldron of innovative um, behavior, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, but I think it's important that, in this, it, that Red Hat in, in, this, in this context is really this sort of catalyst in this galaxy-esque open source, open innovation soup. Um, and I think what's important is uh, maybe in more earthly terms, Red Hat is really the sort of the clutch in the transmission system between these million plus upstream uh, community projects and then and the requirements, enterprise IT requirements in organizations, again, across multiple um, sectors. I think what's re really important, which is, which is sort of stressed at the bottom, is that at every stage um, of this open innovation, this path to product, it enables partners, customers, academia, to participate in every stage. And that's very important in terms of the final, the final outcome. So again, in terms of the participation, uh, you know, we commit something like half of our engineers full-time up there. Uh, we play invariably leading roles in, in, for example, the Linux kernel, the KVM virtualization, OpenStack. And then we go down uh, into the integration side. We harden some of those projects. Uh, we sponsor. Uh, and bring those projects into what's called sort of a consolidated project. And again, a good example, which I'm sure folks will be aware, um, aware of online uh, in the audience is, is Fedora, which of course is the foundation for Red Hat Linux. Um, and these really serve as this software development lab, um, virtual laboratories, where approving grounds for features and so forth. And finally, we, we stabilize it, harden it further to, to, to really meet the, the enterprise grade expectations of performance, security, interoperability, other software, and also that it runs on a multiple of, of hardware. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna sort of flip through this, this one, not going into much detail. Again, it's this million plus projects, which I think is important, the, the blue bubble in the middle. You have the projects on the outside, you see Fedora, and then going up on top left-hand side to Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But again, likewise, same, same thought process across a whole portfolio of products that we have, middleware virtualization, 
uh, storage, cloud compute, and then also interestingly, uh, increasingly, uh, services, training, uh, which again, the, the market is, is wanting um, out of this. So the, the collaboration with universities, um, again, I'm just gonna quickly nip on. There we go, how are we doing for time? Okay, so um, the, other, the other part of the collaboration um, is, is around this aligning curriculum um, with the market's open source software uh, demands. Um, and here we have a difficult to read uh, slides, apologies for that. Um, basically we have a Red Hat Academy program. It's been widely adopted in universities, I think for a number of reasons, curriculum being one as mentioned, uh, but also it, it helps support professors and instructors. Uh, it also helps students in terms of getting certified, which in turn then boosts their career prospects. I think so far around 2000 Red Hat Academies globally um, have entered into uh, this open open source space and, and, and invariably more, more to come. Um, the, the core pillars uh, to the curriculum are system admin, cloud commuting, middleware development. I'm saying that because if there are folks listening who are interested, again, there are links below. You, have, you know, I encourage you to click away um, and you can find out more. A lot of this is, is, is free um, information, free, uh, free um, curriculum, which you can then play with and look at. Uh, and then, you know, let us know if you're, if you're interested uh, to take this further. Uh, I think the other thing which is interesting, um, again, in the context of Europe is, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, in the path of to product uh, explanation, we partner with an, a number of universities um, in a wide range of government funded R&D projects. Uh, we've been involved in this for quite some time, FP6, Seven, various Horizons, and then uh, going forward into the Horizon Europe project. I, I think what's interesting is uh, it, the EU is really pressing pedal to the metal when it comes to closing the gap between the, the R <clears throat> and the D, the research and development. They really want to see that path to product um, in the way in which taxpayers' money is spent. Um, and that's really pulling us more and more into projects. And invariably, we don't go out looking for projects. More, more often than not, we have a, a great universities, some of which are, are listed here on this slide, uh, coming to us um, and really working on extraordinarily exciting um, uh, um, discovery projects, uh, which, which tackle those priorities, both security, big data, cloud, uh, and so forth. So I'd like to also touch on a few observations I've made um, as part of some of some of the interaction between an academic institution and Red Hat. In this case, it's the Alan Turing Institute. Um, I would say that um, before I go any further, the Alan, Alan, the Alan Turing Institute is already doing a lot in open source from the ground up. So this is not a reflection on them. It's more of a, an observation which I think might be helpful to folks on the call um, who are thinking about um, getting more more involved in, in in open source. So again, the first point is the path to product. That's important in terms of longer term viability, and that's something which we can um, lend lend um, some some insight and expertise to. The other bit, which is which is interesting, and again, there is down in the in the sort of resources slide a link to um, choosing the right license, uh, and I think that's really really important. Um, but it's not the whole picture. Uh, the other bit is, is, is culture. I think most of our, many of our, if not all of them, um, whether it's leadership or just Red Hatters in general, will find ourselves talking more and more about this, this, uh, this essence of, of culture, how you embed that and how that is, is triggering open, open innovation. And less and less about the technology, as I said before, it's proven, um, all, the, all the legal frameworks, which again are, are pretty well established, uh, which, which help, um, again, not quite, not yet, but almost uh, level the, the, the playing field between, to, between proprietary and, and open source. Uh, again, I'm conscious of time, so procurement, we've seen that in the past, where sometimes there's somewhat of an outdated version of kind of absorbing uh, open source, and that can sometimes be an obstacle. And finally, governance, you know, a license isn't really necessary, isn't a, isn't necessarily what's um, uh, sufficient in, in its own right. Uh, you still have to have bylaws, governance, uh, which again are critical to scaling some of these projects. Again, there's a there's a link to uh, this um, further further down. Um, again, Thomas, quick check in about timing. We good? Maybe a couple more minutes. Okay. So obviously, as I mentioned, um, there's a very strong support also commercially with universities. Uh, here's um, something which I pinched from one of our. Um, a team in France, so this is a it's a heavily discounted program for for universities. Um, here is the the wonderful Hexagon of La France. Again, interesting snapshot for all the universities that are that are 
um, not just absorbing this technology, but interestingly, perhaps also because of this COVID pressure on budgets and, and I think fr frankly perennial pressure on budgets for universities, um, is that they're pooling IT uh, and working together to, again, do more of that advanced research together and also attract, attract talent um, to the universities. I haven't got time really going to this as much as I'd like to. Uh, suffice to say, robust academic spine to it. Some really interesting thought leaders, um, such as um, Andrew Clay, the Schaefer, Wall of Confusion, Infrastructure as Code, and so on. So you have these these real sort of gurus in there who are helping companies thinking about this. So it's not a it's not a I would like to sort of underline it's not a um, a challenge which only universities have. It's, it's really a challenge you know throughout um, trying to uh, capture and understand what this is all about from a, an open source perspective. Uh, maybe in, 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 in conclusion, I don't think I've ever spoken so fast in my life. So um, and apologies for those not native speakers um, who might find it a bit difficult to, to keep, keep pace. And I'm, I'm sorry for that. Uh, we had to cover a lot in a very short amount of time. Um, but, but to help you, um, I have uh, included some links there. Uh, it goes without saying, um, the, the proverbial virtual door is always open. So you know, please follow up with me, uh, ask me more, more questions. And then maybe, uh, if I may, there's a, a plug for something quite interesting. The EU is having a, a survey right at the end, the, last, the final link, which closes, I think, on the 23rd of October. So please um, have a look at that. If you can fill it in, that'd be great. And then finally, fin finally um, a shameless plug for an event which we're organizing with Ophi and uh, the Linux Foundation on the 5th of February next year. So mark your calendar. Um, this is something, which, again, is very, very topical, um, relevant to, to today's discussion of open innovation. Thomas, back to you. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I thought that was that was very interesting. I think we have an echo. If you could just mute again, please. There we go. Um, I think that was that was extremely interesting. Uh, just what, what I what I latched onto. Um, the, 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 the wealth of community, community projects, which is when we talk to universities often where we find you know the student entrepreneurs and and you find the the small the the the, the small scale projects that that sort of feed the, the the ecosystem that's one thing and then something that certainly is talked a lot about in the university world at the moment and that is companies providing training and providing certificates and and uh, whether that's a good idea or not but you do it for a reason and it's probably beyond this this webinar but i think that was an interesting point i think we're doing progress with easy draw um but maybe uh, uh, maybe we just in order not to to slow things down we will instead of having the framework first maybe have the framework at the end and then go over to walter walter is that okay with you to give us an idea about what you're doing up in Eindhoven and how this looks from the other side of the fence from, from the university. So please go ahead. Is it better now? Do you now hear me? Now? Good. Yeah. Uh, Good. So I hope you you hear me clear and well. Since since I saw in the Q and A that there were some concerns about uh, the connection, so uh, welcome to this session from uh, Eindhoven. Uh, Eindhoven, for those of you that don't know, is in the south of the Netherlands, and it is in the Netherlands commonly known as the brain port of the Netherlands, and that of course compares to the seaport, which is Rotterdam, and to the airport which is Amsterdam. Some say, and I definitely did never verify that, that you have the highest concentration of smart people per square kilometer in the Brainport region. I guess it's a joke, but, but anyway, it, it gives an idea. Uh, the Eindhoven engine, and I'll talk about that, is, is, is an institute, an activity that, amongst others, the Technical University Eindhoven has put in place in order to move more into open innovation. And uh, the, the Eindhoven region is, is extremely famous in the world for mechatronic machine building tradition. And you have companies like Philips, ASML, VDL, which is the old DAF trucks, NXP, 
and you have the old Philips nut labs that have turned into what is called now the high tech campus, which is a huge innovation area, basically. But, and at the same time, given, of course, that focus on mechatronics and machine building, there is extremely limited open source tradition, as, as you can imagine. Um, I rapidly go through these challenges for universities, which I took from the report of the EUA, and where the EUA says what, what the whole issue is, is orchestrating multi-actor innovation methods. And that should be, would be, and we are firmly believers that this will become what we like to call the fourth generation university. And you see here a few of those challenges. Huh? You have to go from linear to reiterative innovation. Most innovation, certainly in the mechatronics area, is still reasonably uh, linear, reasonably straightforward. You have to go from closed tradition to open innovation, uh, from a technological drive to a more systemically organized drive towards innovation, from individual to collaborative, uh, which is also very difficult in universities. Universities have, all universities have traditions to be individuals that, that have their own little research group and that do their research in their group and often even don't talk to their neighbors. Uh, it is all about exchange-based, about creation, and it has to do with innovation spaces, ecosystems. Now, uh, the challenges, particularly for the Technical University of Eindhoven, is that where they have that very strong tradition in mechatronics, of course, data science takes over center stage. You like it, you don't like it, you agree, you don't agree. But even in mechatronic applications, data science is really entering. And that is, in a way, another ball game altogether. The challenges that universities, companies, but we all together as society are confronted with become extremely more complex and therefore need a much more multidisciplinary approach. Now, a technical university, as the word says, only has technical departments, right? So they don't have sociology, they don't have uh, engineer, uh, they don't have business, and they, they don't have psychology. So there is a real challenge to integrate those other disciplines. Then there is, and I would say fortunately, there is a growing call for societal impact. And I refer to the Millennium Goals, but, you know, in general, uh, both from society, from individuals, from the governments and from universities, we feel that we should have more societal impact. And then last, uh, how users uh, experience technology. So that means in the mechatronic business, for instance, I take Philips as an example, uh, they make uh, medical devices uh, where before the focus could be on the quality of the, of the, of the medical device or what it does or how, how well it works. It now becomes more and more an issue of how do people like to work with us product and how do patients, yes or no, improve thanks to that product. Now, these are a few particular challenges at, at the TU Eindhoven. Not that much for Eindhoven, but for its tradition in mechatronics. I like this poem, and I thought to just enlighten your afternoon a little bit with a nice poem of Antonio Machado, a famous Spanish uh, flamenco writer. Wonder your footprints are the path and nothing more. Wonder there is no path, it is created as you walk. By walking, you make the path before you. And when you look behind, you see the path which after you will not be trod again. Wonder there is no path, but the ripples on the waters. And of course, needless to say that in most universities, we concentrate on the path. There is one good path to follow. We teach that path to the students and then they go out and they apply the path. Now, the more we need to tackle the challenges I just mentioned, the more we will have to go to that you lay down the path in walking. And we'll have to train students to be comfortable by laying down the path in walking. Um, the real challenge is not technology, and, and I like to paraphrase uh, the ID space of Cambridge University. They, they say it very nicely. It is not about the technical innovation. They exist, they will continue to exist, and that's what often takes place in universities. However, 
there are many of them and many of those innovations never come to a product or a service. So that's not necessarily interesting. At the other hand, ID Space says we're not interested in the startups since the startups spend all their time on starting up. And, and, and at the end, what they drive for is being bought out. As I say it a little bit blunt, but basically to cash as soon as possible. What they are interested in and what we are interested in as the Eindhoven engine is business model innovation. Who can come up with a business model that has impact, eh? that does something meaningful, that is scalable, so it is not just a little solution in a little corner, and that, of course, at the end of the day, is economically viable, since otherwise we're not going to be able to commercialize it. That is what the Eindhoven engine is, is trying to foster is the creation of such business models based definitely on existing technology, but trying to get it rapidly to the market. Now, what is Eindhoven Engine? It's a cooperation of three partners, which is the Technical University Eindhoven, the University of Applied Sciences, which is called Fontis, which has its headquarters equally in Eindhoven, and TNO, the Dutch Science Foundation. Right, so it's 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 a very strong cooperation of those three, and those three, uh, all three see the same. Right? They develop fantastic technology. They are very proud of what they do. Needless to say, and they're worth to be proud. However, it is all in different corners. And how can you sort of bring all those smart people together in order to come up with solutions to problems that really matter? But now I've lost my transparency. I don't know whether everybody has lost it. Since then, you have it, Thomas? No? OK, you have it back. I Thank you. It. Thank you. No, no, good. Perfect. Fine. So uh, what the Eindhoven engine is, is nothing more or nothing less than an innovation ecosystem where we bring together uh, bigger companies, uh, the, the main companies of the region, obviously, smaller companies, the SMEs, uh, startups, students, researchers. And we would like to bring them together with the, with the conviction that the more you bring diverse people together, the more you run the risk to get to innovations. And I admit that it should become much more diverse still, eh? since we're still too much in that technical corner. So we have to move on a little bit to include other parts of society. It concentrates on open innovation and on co-creation. Therefore, we also have co-location. Now, with Corona, that is slightly difficult. So we, we have a virtual co-location. I wrote somewhere a post about virtual co-location. I, I really thought I had to do that. But co-location, the fact that people get together and the organized accident, eh? the organized accident that people meet, start to talk to each other, suddenly find a common interest and, and decide to, to, to join forces, to join ideas and to come up with, with new developments, right? For that, we support that uh, those projects with a method which is based on design thinking and on systems thinking. Huh? So it is, it is slightly off-road from what most technical universities will do. And obviously, it is challenge-based. Huh? So we, we work on, on real problems of the world. Huh? So it is not uh, a place where you have, say, applied research for the fun of applied research. The purpose is really to accelerate innovation and to get faster uh, to higher readiness levels and eventually to a uh, product to market. And uh, this is sort of a, a representation of, of a number of activities that are taking place in the Eindhoven Academy. You have inter-partner projects, in-partner projects, you have content seminars, uh, we occasionally have a hackathon. We do use a lot of students, lots of PhDs, lots of Padang professional doctoral doctorate in engineering students. I don't know whether it's a typical Dutch product. I think so. We can even use kids. And uh, we are thinking about launching our own Padang, eh? professional doctorate in engineering program in business model innovation. What you want to create is that middle. It's, it's, I like to call it a, a space of magic, you know, a, a quantum world of ideation where ideation, where everything is possible. And we, we always limit our innovation up front by saying, you can't do this. We've tried that. It doesn't work. Technology doesn't allow us. 
that is not the way how we're going to get to innovation. The point is everything is possible until proven of the contrary, right? So you really want to create that world of, of ideation and that that energy eh, of, of imagination where everything, theoretically, everything is possible. And that's the real purpose of what the Eindhoven engine does. I didn't... Uh, focus on that, but I want to say it here. The Eindhoven engine sits really on the border of the university. So it is it is a limited liabilities company. So it is a structure outside the university where the technical university is, of course, shareholder huh, with hardly any shares. But anyway, where the University of Applied Science is a shareholder and the Science Foundation is a shareholder. So it's a real limited liabilities company that can operate completely as a company. That is not easy and the university doesn't have the tradition and therefore you sometimes fall back on, on yeah, well-known structures and situations. And last, again, I would like to give you a thought. If you want to build a ship, call people together and give them the, a desire for the endless sea. And again, that is not what we're used to do in universities and certainly not technical universities. But that is, for me, that is the idea of open innovation. That's the experience that we have at the Eindhoven Engine that I wanted to share with you. And I hope you, you see some interesting uh, ideas in there. OK, thank you very much, Walter. I think uh, the idea about that this is a world of, of, of magic and wonder um, is something that it, it sounds very fluffy, but but it, it, when you've seen it work in practice, it it it, it does actually work. Mm -hmm. uh, but Absolutely. I think if, if if we get if we get easy drawback, I think it, it's an interesting point also to the political discussion because I think in not as much on the European level, but on many national levels, uh, your let's say evaluations is not you're not evaluated by the the magic you do, but more about you know. Uh, hard indicators, you know, how many patents do we get and, and, and things like this. But I just see with our technical people if if there's a hope we get we get easy draw because we could see him listening in before and he's getting in there. Hello, can you hear me? So let's see how it works. Yes, we can hear you easy draw. You can Turn on your microphone. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, very well. Yes. So I'm having a lot of problems today with the with the connection, with the internet. Sorry, sorry for that. Well, if you can hear me well, I will start now. Uh, I'm from the European Commission. I have been 20 years in the in the service, and, and now I am in the, I am the cabinet expert for innovation in the in the for the commissioner gabriel so uh, i will uh, start talking a little bit uh, about what is uh, open innovation for me and for uh, for us and essentially is the oh, realization really. of a new reality the realization that the uh, traditional research department the the company, problem, yeah. or the traditional research uh, um, uh, labs from the companies are uh, not capable any longer to innovate as they used to do in the past. And it's a reality that they both in that big companies, but also universities are facing. And that's how somehow the, the wording of open innovation appear. It's not that before was closed. It's that the idea of opening to, to, to all the players of the innovation. And I think Walter, Professor Walter uh, Bites mentioned about the concept of innovation ecosystems. And it's somehow a synonym of, of both. So open innovation is, at the end of the day, I used to say, the old players, the universities, corporates, working with the new players, the startups, the young innovators, and also young, and also with the citizens at large. That's also a dimension that is part of this innovation ecosystem, and even with public administrations like the European Commission. So the idea is that uh, the, 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 there are, let's say, two modalities. One is that the one that is nowadays more extended across the world, that is the industries working with uh, the, the, the startups. And this was the, the famous uh, matchmaking events that are happening across Europe. In the, in the EU, we have the Startup Europe Partnership, which organizes this matchmaking between big corporates 
and start us all across Europe and in the States and in, in Israel, etc. But there is a new way of opening innovation around universities. And I think it's very well reflective of what uh, Walter was uh, saying before. No? The idea, and I, I was a fellow in Cambridge for some time, and I, they, they were also uh, uh, experimenting with this concept. No? The idea they had is that the university is very good in connections with big industry. It's very good also in the students, and in, in the case of Cambridge, but also in, in, in Hoven, very high qualified students. So what they were trying to become is a bridge between the big company, who they have a need for a, a, an innovative solution, and through the university to reach out to the students, the most talented students in the university, so that they would be the startups or innovative companies to solve the problem of the, of the, of the university. So it was a very peculiar type of, of opinion innovation, but at the end of the day was to recognize first that the huge majority of innovation does not come from research. And there's so many data and so many studies about that. And, and Professor Byatt mentioned about business models innovation, and there are so many other ways of innovation that are not directly linked to, it, to, to research. So that's, that's what in Cambridge uh, University recognized that the majority of the startups in Cambridge are not coming from spin-offs of universities, are students who are setting up the companies to, set, uh, to solve some problems of the society or the big companies. And here, I want to challenge uh, this uh, concept of that research and innovation, they are together. For me, what is together is innovation and education. Because what is common in the 19, I don't know, percentage, but huge percentage, 95, 96% is all the people who are setting up companies, innovative companies, innovative solutions, the huge majority come from the university. They have been studying in university either recently or a bit longer, but this is always a link between education and, 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 and innovation. And this is why I think the universities should have a much important role than the ones they have been having until now on innovation. And I'm talking about the universities, about education, the education system, not necessarily the researchers or the research departments. And this a change of paradigm of uh, thinking of the, uh, even in the European Commission. In the European Commission, we have a department that was in the, uh, three years ago was called only research. And another par department was called only education. Well, the, the, the Department of Research had changed the name like one year and a half ago to research and innovation. Well, the Director General was very clever there, but certainly why not the education could have done the same? Because they still had the mentality that for them is, is, is education in the in the traditional way. But for me, the, this famous triangle of uh, research, uh, education, and innovation is goes both ways. Not only innovation to research, but also innovation to 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 education. So you don't need to go from education to research to to innovation. You can go from innovation uh, from education to innovation and from research to innovation in the triangle, no? And this is, this is a change of paradigm that I think is very important that, that is done by university. This requires new structures. The traditional uh, transfer offices of the, of the universities, they, they are not adaptive for this, the kind of people they have that. There is the, the, they have a research on a lab and they are looking for customers, uh, licenses, the patents, etc. That's not what we are talking about. So we need new, new, new organizations like the one in Eindhoven who are bringing, and I know also, for example, another one in, 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 in Amberes, in Ambers, who are uh, bringing something uh, similar to what you have done in Eindhoven, but even they have uh, brought together startups, associations from the city, they have brought together some uh, citizens' representatives and big industry. So you have TNO and, and the two universities, but this is even bigger, no? But at the end of the, at the, end of the, of the way, uh, the, 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 is the realization that they cannot use the traditional research uh, transfer uh, offices of the, of the universities. They have to do something different. They have created also, like you and Hoven, a new legal entity that allows others to participate more freely than if it is the university that has many more constraints. And there's also another part that is needed. So you need new uh, change of paradigms, mentality. No, It's not only education, research, and innovation. No, you can go directly from education to innovation. But this also this requires new structures, but also requires a new way of evaluating the professors. The professors, and I have been myself, no professor, but associate in, in Spain, 
in Madrid University. Then you are rewarded by the number of, of uh, publications in international journals that you have. And that's good for research. If you want to stimulate research, that's a very good way to do that. How to stimulate innovation in the universities through the, a new reward mechanism? I have no, no clear ideas about how to do that, but certainly this needs to be done. I mean, you can say, well, the number of startups that the professor is helping their students to create. Fine, but then we can have a inflation of startups. No, we need startups that are viable. No, so maybe we need to 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 think on on other more complex uh, indicators for this. No, I want to make an open call here. I see there are more than six hundred uh, uh, registrations, and I see people from Moldova, India, and of course uh, all across Europe and uh, all across the EU. So I want to make an open, uh, open call to you to rethink the new role of, of universities in innovation, not going through research, but directly from education to, to innovation. And I will appreciate that you sent to me your ideas uh, either to my Twitter account, uh, Isidro Lasso, I will write it here in the, in the, in the chat. It's Isidro Lasso in, in Twitter, but the same in, in, in LinkedIn. Uh, you can send to me your ideas about how you see the role of the uh, universities on, on, on fostering e uh, innovation by linking directly the education to the innovation. And this is for me all the what I wanted to share with you. I hope I will still be able to, to maintain the connection that the internet will work here as well to be able to listen to the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much, James and Walter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isidro. I had my own problems here. Everybody froze, but I'm back, um, and and uh, and I can I can see you. I can see you all. Um, so we have some some uh, questions which are being published. Um, there's there's a. I just have to go to them and say there is a question about new patent application from universities in Europe and how many and it's five percent in, in, in the US. I don't think we know easy to we might have some 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 how many new patent applications come from university. But maybe Walter you can say is is that is that actually important? Is that a measure? How many come from universities? How many patents universities make? Yeah, you will. You, you, as, a, as somebody you know, coming from I, university, <laughs> I I can I can give you my opinion, of course, which is not necessarily the university's opinion. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and 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 the reason, of course, is the more you have patents, the more you're not in open source eh, in in a way. So it, it, it's contradiction in terminus. Hey, eh? you 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 shouldn't strive anymore for for that closed intellectual property, but you should strive to find solutions to real problems. Right? What, what Isidro said a few times, eh? I mean, and, and if we could, <laughs> you went very far and I agree with you, but if you could go straight from education to innovation, you would win a lot of steps. I absolutely agree. And our, we ourselves experiment with living labs in our programs and in those living labs, you work on innovations straight away. Eh? So, uh, I would agree. I think if you would certainly in technical universities talk to the governing bodies, just as much as academic publications count, patents count. If you take the MITs and the Stanfords of the world, they are proud about all the intellectual property that they have registered. And the tradition is certainly to measure it in that way. I think if you would like to go ahead, we will have to change that measurement. Yeah. Uh, this this is something that that, that we definitely we, we hear we hear as well. Um, we have another question that a lot of people like, and it's very simple for James. That is how how do you collaborate with with Red Hat if you're a university, and and it, it it might be good if you give an example of of how these things if if you have an example ready how these things come about how how do, how does a sort of an open innovation partnership come about on on the ground. So I think it could come from a, a number of sources. Uh, if we have time, I'd like to make a point on the, the patent question yeah, earlier. Yeah, but, sure. Um, uh, the, um, I mean, the source could well be um, from uh, this participation stage that I mentioned, 
Um, nothing stops uh, universities or individuals in those universities um, and the ecosystems like Nine Over to, to, to get plugged in. Um, and I think the, 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 natural, the perception is that those are those are individuals sort of sitting at their kitchen tables, absolutely COVID era they are, but they, they are also coming from very large industrials, they're coming from governments, they're coming from um, all sorts of um, uh, areas where I think people don't, don't um, expect that to happen. Um, and that includes universities. So that's one area. The other is, so it's a bit, that's probably the sort of unconventional area. The other one is more conventional that there are calls, there are tenders, there are serious problems which the world's trying to solve. Um, and, and, and the EU's doing a great job to channel those, that brain power onto, uh, that lens onto, onto the problems. Uh, and I, I see that actually working very well. And the question about Red Hat, you know, we don't, um, have uh, a, a kind of an office or a people or a person dedicated to looking at all these calls to tender. And that's because normally we get pulled in 99% of the time by universities <coughs> across Europe uh, because they want that uh, pathway to product. They want to know how that's done. They also, what's really interesting, I'll close here, is they want to know how to scale at the end of the, the research project program and put it out into the market. How do you do that? How do you create this ecosystem, which is then going to almost productize it? And that's something which is, you know, it's um, it, there's an increasing demand for that from universities to Red Hat. Yeah. So, so, so you, you you feel like universities are often taking the first step and and, and uh, getting getting in touch, and that's yeah, that that would correspond to things that we have as universities as a sort of plays an orchestrating role. You 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 might say. I mean, we have um, our own, we have our own department. It's a Red Hat research. Um, again, the link is provided. But you know, so a huge number. I think our largest engineering facility in the world is in Bruno in the Czech Republic, and therefore, of course, physical proximity to the University of Bruno in in that city means there's a hell of a lot of collaboration that happens between those two universities. But now, um, that's been replicated uh, across, um, and there are sort of pop up uh, uh, collaborations happening here, there, and everywhere. And of course, a lot of this happens in this virtual space. So. So even the dreaded COVID hasn't really put the brake on that kind of collaboration. Yeah, uh, we, we get a lot of questions here. I can see from rolling down, and we don't have we don't have the time to to take all of them. But one is about the the definition you actually use on uh, on on open innovation. I mean, what what is like it? Like something an open innovation, like if I an open innovation project. Oh. I don't know who wants to. to <laughs> Go you, want, you want, yeah. Uh, look, an open innovation is an open innovation project is is a, a project uh, in which nobody claims intellectual property in order to protect it. You yeah. see, you can claim intellectual property since you've invented it and it's your idea and and that's fine and everybody knows that it's me. Wow, great! But the problem starts when you try to limit it and therefore try to commercialize it. Mm -hmm. And and it is of course an outcome of our liberal capitalistic way of looking at the universities over the last thirty years, that we even made intelligence a sellable product, which personally I think is a dangerous route. I think it's a wrong route, but that's my personal opinion. It doesn't matter. But it's a dangerous route since you limit a lot of 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 what happens on research, what is even sometimes publicly funded. And then afterwards, even in EU projects, I've been involved in a number of EU projects where you had that discussion. You see, so open innovation for me is an, is an innovation where nobody of the partners claims close intellectual rights. Yeah, so it's, it's really the, the, the IP. Um, yeah. And I think I have two extra questions for that that also come from the audience, unless somebody wants to come in on the definition of, of, of open innovation here, uh, Isidro or James. Because if that's not the case, there's someone asking, so how do you protect it? So do, is this then a free-for-all? You don't, you don't protect it. Maybe James wants to say something about this. How, how do you then protect what you're doing? Can, can and, I the just say is, and the other one is, um, if, if, if we want to move away from this, you know, how much money do you make and, and do you, do you uh, evaluate this if something becomes a unicorn or not? Um, and and what, are, what are we going to do with, with really and valuing social knowledge. Um, but, but James, maybe you want to talk about how, how, do you protect, how do you protect what you're doing? Because you need to protect something about what you're doing now. 
So, so maybe just reiterate the, the point I made on that slide where I said it wasn't linear. Uh, it is actually quite rather messy um, uh, in practice. Um, but the, 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 the choice of license is really important. So right at the beginning, depending on your, your, your portfolio of, of patents, be they uh, um, royalty bearing or even restriction free, um, the, the choice of patent really indicates where you want to go with this project. Uh, and then, of course, the decision making is such that if you have a problem and you go out there onto, say, GitHub, you see someone else has got a solution that's more or less what you're doing. Um, you don't really care too much about who owns it. The fact the license is allowing you to borrow it or even better, improve it. So you then put a, a pull request to the maintainer of that project who then says, that's brilliant. We'll have that. Um, and then you can then go off and use that, um, that, uh, that solution in your, in your IT stack for your customer and you, and you move on. So the kind of the ownership is, is almost secondary. And I think um, the, the, the emphasis really is solving the problem. You implement first the, 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 the solution. Um, if then it starts scaling, because it's an excellent solution, uh, then you start talking about whether there needs to be a standard or not. Um, and if there is, then there are a number of four consortia, but also increasingly uh, more um, traditional um, standards organizations which would do, do the trick. And maybe the final point in the patents bit is, you know, we, we have um, thousands of patents. Uh, and the reason why we have thousands of patents and they're all restriction free is the reason is, is to help um, customers, partners, uh, uh, who may well have potentially an issue uh, with regards to uh, sort of that patent question. Um, and now we have uh, interestingly seen huge growth in open and open network, lot network with hundreds of thousands of patents uh, which have been pulled in there because they realize that uh, if you don't give that certainty, again, from that ownership question, to those people who want to innovate, that it's going to really kill the, 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 the risk um, uh, aspect. You know, there's going to be people who are going to concern that their house will go. So once that's, got that, once that's abstracted out because of these kinds of portfolios that have been put together, um, then you have the, and you pick the right license, uh, then I think the, almost the, 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 the ownership is, is, is rather, rather secondary. And then the business follows to Walt's point. Fascinating conversation for another time, I think, but we can happily talk more about our subscription based model. How, how, uh, yeah. I understand each of you has an issue with, with hearing us. Uh, can you hear us, Easy Draw? No. Okay, I'll just write, write this question. Um, keep on comfortable with so you can hear me i can hear you can hear so one question walter could you try to uh, mute yourself because for some reasons, when you are unmuted, I can only hear you. Let me see. Okay, can you hear me now? Words, but because I was hearing you all the time, only what? Okay. Yeah, so it's the, one the is question is, how can we value social, non-commercial innovation? That was the question, Thomas. Yeah, that's the question so, of the audience. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what you mean by, by this non-commercial innovation. I suppose you are talking about uh, uh, social innovation, but uh, social innovation has a value as well. So it's uh, yeah. non-commercial, it doesn't mean that has no value. It's mm -hmm. only maybe that the ones uh, to, that have to pay for that uh, innovation is not uh, the, the private customers, but might be the public, uh, uh, the public organizations or maybe foundations or others who are willing to pay for these social uh, benefits. No? So I think all innovations have, uh, have a value. And what, you, what the Professor Baez said uh, very correctly, what the important is that there is a business model behind and someone has to pay for it. I mean, there is nothing free. Every, uh, there are people working on, on something that people have to be rewarded and they have to be paid. The, the problem is who can pay for that. But the, I think, and, and I think all the, the innovation has to have a social benefit. But I mean, we need to to think a bit out of the box on what is social, no? Social uh, actually helping any people to solve the problems they are having is social. Sometimes people are more inclined to pay for those things. And in other cases, we are more psychologically with the mindset that the public organization has to pay for that. For example, in, in Spain, 
people think that the, the education has to be pay, paid by the, by the authorities. Well, in other parts of Europe, more Nordic uh, parts of Europe, people are more inclined to say, we have my money, I will spend the money on the education of my kids. And they pay for that. So the, the same uh, innovation or education in, inno in education, for example, in teaching methods, is uh, in some cases will be paid by the by the public authorities in countries like Spain, but in other countries where people will be, be willing to pay from their pockets for that education. No? So this is uh, I think all the, the important thing is that there is a business model on how uh, to, to to get paid for the people who is doing the work. Uh, and that's what is important. What is not acceptable is like a few days ago, I have some startups coming to, to me to say, well, our business model does not work. We need that the, the, the public authorities are, are, are covering our costs. No? And then I, I said, well, we can do it in the early stages, or if they, but then you have to see a moment in which you will be able to, to pay for the cost of what is this generated, because otherwise this is not sustainable. They were not... Uh, there were no public authorities, there were private startups, no? and for some reason they were expecting, I don't know how and why, that we were going to cover the cost indefinitely to uh, for that. No? So the business model, I think, is, is key. I fully agree with the presentation of, of Bison on that, and, uh, and uh, non-commercial innovation doesn't mean it no, has no value. So. Oh, that's that's. I think that's that's very comforting to hear because often you have this. You know, what is what is a measure of success? Uh, how many unicorns do we have in Europe? And 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 discussion can be somewhat somewhat bigger than that. I think we're running slightly over time. I don't want to uh, rob anybody's time. I I don't think we uh, came completely around all the issues because it's such a large, uh, such such a large area to 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 work with. Uh, we from the side of the UA hope that we can continue this discussion, that we can continue it at some point physically, synchronously, um, get people together, get also uh, all of, of the people where the answers weren't quest uh, weren't weren't uh, the questions weren't answered, and um, and all the people that that uh, participated in the chat to sit together and and actually be physically together and and uh, share that. But um, for now, I got a lot wiser. I thought it was very inspiring. I hope it was for all of you. Um, we hope to continue the discussion with all of you participants. We hope to continue the discussion with uh, our, our speakers. Many, many thanks. I, I think that was extremely valuable to listen to. And uh, this recording will be available on YouTube uh, very shortly. And with these words, I'll just say goodbye.